Thank you, Nancy. And if there's any children's church kids left in here, let me encourage let be dismissed for children's church, for children's church. So last week uh, we had left uh, kind of our prophet that we've been talking about, the, the prophet Elijah on, on Mount Carmel. And uh, it was a one of those major moments in his life, one of the highlights, perhaps, for the nation of, of Israel. And it reminded me of an experience that uh, I had some years ago, back in 1998. I was living in Colorado, and that summer, two friends and I went on a series of hikes, and uh, most weekends, we'd pick a, a little bit of a challenge, and we worked our way up the front range, and our goal was to, by the end of the summer, be ready for an ascent of uh, Long's Peak. Long's Peak is one of the highest mountains on the Front Range and the highest mountain in Rocky Mountain National Park at 14,259 feet of elevation. Finally, after the end of the summer, after all the snow had finally melted off the top of Long's Peak and uh, the trail was open, we finally found a date for our Ascent. We started really in the middle of the, of the night. It's, uh, most of the ascent isn't uh, a hard hike. It's just a, a long hike. It's about eight miles from uh, the parking lot up the trail to, to the top. And the first seven miles of it are a fairly simple uh, uphill walk for those seven miles. Well, finally, we got up to kind of the base of the climb at the top, and uh, the first thing you find when you come to Long's Peak is the boulder field. There's a, a huge uh, field full of large boulders that you kind of climb across and up. Uh, some of it hands and, and knees and all sorts of things. You actually climb for a while up through what they call the, the keyhole. And uh, at, the, at the keyhole, you pass from the front of the peak to the the back side, and on the back side, you make your way along these slick rocks, and uh, you find a little path kind of carved out, and you look for these little bullseyes that have been painted in there to show you kind of the safe path along these uh, slick rock of the back side. And you come up finally to this stretch, uh, the narrows, and you follow the narrows along the, the side, and these little skinny path as you go along to what is called the, the home stretch, and then uh, up onto the summit. I didn't want that picture quite yet. All right, so we spent all day uh, making our way. We probably took us, uh, you know, four hours to get up to the top of Long's Peak. And we reached the top of Long's Peak and we couldn't see a thing. Uh, the clouds had come in and it was like walking in a great big fog up on top of there, but it was something about being on the top. It was a, kind of a large flat area. It's about the size of a maybe a football field up there, and it is uh, um, fairly flat for, for quite a ways, and the edge is pretty well defined. We weren't worrying about falling off and taking pictures, of course, with the sign that said we made it, even though we couldn't see anything uh, off the side of the mountain. We just wanted to, you know, take our time and enjoy the accomplishment for some time until in the distance we heard the rumble of thunder. Didn't take much of a hint that thunderstorms were coming, that we began to make our way down the mountain. By the time we made it back to the boulder field, we were in the middle of a lightning storm on the top of Long's Peak. And if there's one place you don't want to be in a lightning storm, it's the Long's Peak. Man, it is loud and you're surrounded by all of these trees that are blackened from previous lightning strikes and uh, you're so exposed. We begin to run down the mountain till we got well into the trees, well below tree line, which is a pretty good part of the hike back down. You don't want to be on Long's Peak in a lightning storm. We left Elijah, God's prophet on Mount Carmel, and a rainstorm is coming for him. There's going to come a moment where he too runs down the mountain, ahead of the rain, in the rain, perhaps. But let me back up. The story of Elijah. God came to Elijah, the, the Tishbite from Tishbe, and told him to go warn the king that there would be no rain until they humbled themselves before God. And for three and a half years, Elijah 
hid from the king and from all of his searchers, and there was neither dew nor rain on the land of Israel. When that time was finished, God invited the king and all the people to kind of a showdown on Mount Carmel. And Elijah gathered them together and challenged the prophets of Baal to offer a sacrifice. And they would offer a sacrifice and he would offer a sacrifice. And the, the God who answered by fire, he'd be the real God. So the prophets of Baal, they go from morning till after, through the afternoon till evening, crying out to their gods, and nothing, nothing happens. Elijah steps forward, and he gathers the people to him and prays a simple prayer. And then the fire of the Lord fell, burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. And in that moment, people's hearts are cut to the quick. They realize that they've been worshiping false gods. Their, their, their view of how they relate to God is just another God, or as the supreme God has finally changed. And they acknowledge that he is the Lord alone. They fall before God and they cry out, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. They follow through on their convictions by taking all those false prophets down to the valley and killing them there as an act of obedience and as an act of purification for their, their nation. Now that, that's a mountaintop experience, right? That, that maybe is the moment that defined all mountaintop experiences to, to follow. But there was something still that needed to take place. For the nation, for the people, for that moment in time, the rain, the rain needs to come. The rain needs to come to refresh the land. It needs to come for there to be a future for them as a people. The rain needs to come. God's promise needs to finally find its fulfillment. I want to talk about that. The promise, the things that God has said he would do. What, think about the purpose they fulfill in our hearts and in our lives. That hope of seeing the fulfillment of God's promise. Not, not just the, the big one, you know, the return of Christ in the day to come, but his work in your hearts and life, his provision for what you need, his joy in, in your life, his, his voice to show you the way, the way that you are to walk in it. As we look at Elijah this morning, one of the things that comes really clear is that this is an important part of being a follower of God. Really, everything about our future, everything about our hope comes from God's promise. God's the one that tells us what to expect. We we don't need to guess. It's written for us in his word. Those things that he wants to trust him for are right here in the Bible. We don't get to make it up ourselves, and we need to know those things that he has said because what God is going to do, what he wants to do in our lives, he's already told us. God promises what, what he will do. That in Elijah's story, right, there's a, a historic foundation for this drought and repentance for the people of Israel. It comes from a really well-known passage in the Old Testament that takes place when Solomon has finally finished building the temple. And the day has come to dedicate the Lord's temple there in Jerusalem for the people and for the use, for it to serve its purpose among the nation of, of Israel. And in God's instructing Solomon in that time. He looks forward to well, the, the reality of the future. And he says, and when, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send a plague among the people, said, look, when your hearts wander, I, I'm going to do my best for you to realize that something is not right, that something in your land is amiss. He says, when those things happen, kind of, Begin to pay attention to my word and look at how you're living. 
And then he makes this promise. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So in their day, in Elijah's day, God had shut up the heavens. He had brought them to a place of confrontation, and the people had humbled themselves. And now Elijah begins to look to God's promise for the healing on land. People are ready. They're ready to seek God's face, that The people have put to death the false prophets. They have repented. The king even seems to have aligned his heart with God's prophet. He he accepts Elijah's directions. It's it's an important thing to look at that step, right? Before God pours out his blessing, before the rain are restored in this moment, there needs to be brokenness, right? Brokenness comes before God's blessing, Repentance before the refreshing of God's Spirit. But the blessing and the refreshing will come. It's promised by God. It's that when, then I will. Of the Second Chronicles chapter 7. Really that sense of believing, of trusting God's promise, of saying God has said it. I, I want to connect to it. We uh, think of Abraham, perhaps, as the primary example of someone who lived by faith. And when Paul writes to the church in Rome, he uses Abraham as an example of how important it is to trust what God says and to believe it. He talks about Abraham and describes him this way. He said, Yet Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Fully persuaded. How about you? Are you fully persuaded that God can do what he's promised? When you read it in his word, when he says what he will do, how convinced are you? Because that's the purpose of God's promise. God's promises are there to invite our trust. Elijah demonstrates that. It demonstrates a dependence on God's word and a confidence in God's promise. Now he says to the king, the the rain is coming, get ready for it. Elijah says to Ahab, go eat and drink for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink. Elijah's encouraging his king to trust God's promise. He's saying, look, believe it, and you're going to see it. Confidence in God through his faithfulness. There's a, a story of a man traveling through the, the south on a really hot day, and he stops at a roadside stand and uh, picks out a, a watermelon. And he asks the proprietor how much the watermelon is, and the guy says, well, it's it's." $2.25. And the guy reaches in his pocket and he pulls out his money and he realizes, I've, I've only got $2. And uh, the, the guy says, well, that's okay. I'll, I'll trust you for it. Oh, the guy says, well, that's very nice of you. And he grabs the watermelon and he walks outside and uh, the man behind the counter says, hey, 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 wh- where are you going? The guy says, well, I'm, I'm going out to me- eat my watermelon. But the guy says, but you forgot to pay for it. He said, I thought you said you were going to trust me for it. And I said, well, I'm going to trust you for the 25 cents, not the $2. Sometimes for you and I, we think of God's promises like that. We're willing to trust him for some things, but not for the whole load. Not for him to do everything he's said. For Elijah, he's, he's trusting God, his hope, has come from God's promise. That's why God gave them in the first place, so that your hearts, my hearts, can be fixed on what God said he would do. And really, that's the focus of how we approach God, how we pray 
to him. Our, our prayers rest on God's faithfulness. So he tells the king to go eat, but Elijah himself climbs to the top of Mount Carmel and he bends down to the ground and he puts his face between his knees and he turns to his servant and he says, go and look toward the sea. And the servant went up and looked and returned and he says, there's nothing there. So Elijah is not focused on the skies. He's not just standing there, you know, shading his eyes, looking out. He's He's focused on something else. He seems to be, have his focused attention on God, and that's what prayer is. Prayer is this sense, not, not just you know, folding your hands and bowing your head and, and having a, a sentence or two that you pray to God with your eyes closed, but it is, first of all, an awareness of who God is and where God is. Any genuine prayer has this sense of coming to God, our Father which art in heaven. We sing the worship songs in our time together. And I wonder how aware we are of God's listening as we say those words, as we sing them out. And sometimes the fact that we go along with the song, right? We just say the next words. They're there for us tends to separate us from what's actually coming out of our mouth rather than focusing our attention on the God we're singing to. This attention in our lives, this, this deciding our focus is, is really important. It's certainly no more important than when we come before God and find what we need from him. And Jesus tells a parable that illustrates how important it is. It's the parable of the tax collector and the, and the Pharisee. And Jesus describes a, a situation in the temple where two men come to pray. And uh, the, oh, let's see. Sorry, I got, I got a little ahead of myself. Now I'm really not sure where I'm at. Let's see. <laughs> Let me back up. Yeah, focused attention on God. Uh, and you wonder what he's, he's doing here. Okay, so there's this phrase where it tells us. It tells us that Elijah is um, bowing with his like, face to the ground, right? It's just this funny, this funny moment. And I wonder if he actually is praying. Is he praying? Because it doesn't say he's, he's praying, right? It just says he's bent down to the ground and he puts his face to, to the ground. And his prayer is so different from his previous prayer, right? His previous prayer, when he had gathered all the people together and he's praying for God to send the fire, goes like this. He says, he steps forward and he prays, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known that today you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. And have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God. And that you are turning their hearts back to them. Now that's a prayer. Right? He's, 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 he's there. He's focused. He's standing. His hands are probably raised up to the Lord. And he is shouting out his plea to God. He is focused. Uh, on God in that moment. But this moment, it just says that he's bent to the ground and has his face between his knees. It doesn't say he's praying. There's nobody listening. There's no words were given. And in fact, that phrase there, bent down, kind of an interesting phrase. In fact, it, it's a word uh, that occurs in only one other setting in, in the Bible. In one other Old Testament setting. And it occurs in the story of, well, Elijah's successor, Elisha. And it's translated just a little bit differently in that setting. It's, in that setting, it's same word is translated stretched out. In, in 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha finds himself in another really difficult situation. A 
child that he has, he has invested in has died. And the widow comes back to him and asks for help. And Elijah goes to the home, and it tells us in 2 Kings chapter 4 that Elijah, Elisha stretched himself out on him. The boy's body grew warm, and Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room, and then he got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. That, that phrase there, stretched out, it's the same Hebrew word that in 1 Kings 18 is used as bent down. Stretched out, bent down, it's hard to see what they really have in common, but there is this sense of focus on what's going on for Elisha. He's violating all sorts of Jewish taboos about dead bodies. This isn't a family member. This is someone that he's interacted with in the past, but to so identify with this dead boy, he lines up with him, right? Face to face, hand to hand, lays on top of this boy's body. There's some kind of focus, some kind of, wow, real and uh, intent action going on here. Jesus talked about that sense of focus in the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. He described how the tax collector stood at a distance and, oh, am I, and wouldn't even... Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm confused again. Okay, it's the Pharisee, right? Stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I, I get. For the moment, who's the most important person in this prayer? <laughs> I mean, he's focused on himself, isn't he? He is aware of all the things that he has done and how different he is and how blessed he is. And it's all about himself. But the tax collector, Jesus says, stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus gives us the bottom line. He says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Our prayers rest on God's faithfulness. Genuine prayers focused on God. And prayer trusts the hand of God. I want you to know that Elijah is not making it rain. This isn't some kind of technique to bring rain from Mount Carmel, right? For some reason, he even seems afraid to go look and watch for rain. And so he sends his servant. He says, go and look toward the sea. The servant goes up and he looks and comes back and reports there's nothing there. He says, well, go look again. Again, the servant comes back. There's nothing there. He says, well, Go look again.